Welcome to episode 72 of the Permaculture Pimp Cast, the only pimp cast on planet Earth where we discuss permaculture, preparedness, and practical living. How you doing, son? Good. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm losing my voice a little bit. Um, I'm hoping... Felt like I've been battling the bug for the last couple of days. I've been kicking up this vitamin C like nobody's business. I know I was coming down with something because I've taken, shoot, man, every hour I've been taking like 1,500 milligrams of vitamin C and 500 of that is liposomal vitamin C, but we'll see how it goes. Been taking in plenty of bone broth and stuff like that. Just trying to get through it, y'all. Just like everybody else. And I, I wonder if it ain't a result of this last weekend. You better be careful about how much vitamin C you're taking when you're out in public, Dad. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, y'all, I was hooking him up on some vitamins. And the problem is... Um, we he, don't take the same dose. <laughs> yeah, I take a much higher dose and I've kind of... Anyway, he hit bowel tolerance and probably not at the best times. So I was <laughs> no. giving him what I was taking. And honestly, I've kind of hit that point too but you really didn't tune in for that all right y'all this episode brought to you by hickory ridge so from two old crows.com turn that simp into a pimp bam also 50 bucks off from emp shield you want to check out that new micro they got that thing is the cat's meow so would that work on a solar power generator well go to emp shield if you if you want one um they have one for every single just about every single thing you can imagine whether it's a generator, a solar generator, anything. They'll they'll walk you into what model is best for you. But I'm going to say, I, I to be honest with you, I haven't put the micro on that. Um, they make one for the house. And honestly, the number one, here's your biggest threat there. I know we got more to get to, but your number one threat is not necessarily an EMP. And I've been trying to make this point out there. What's your number one threat when it comes to your house, son? Well, lightning, but also that. Okay, so a lot of houses nowadays have that like generator hookup on the outside. What if you already had your generator hooked up, and then your house got struck by lightning? Well, that's Does exactly. That, I mean, well, that's that exactly stop? what this thing's supposed to do. Is going to shun it. Or basically work like a switch. It's going to take it to ground long before it does any damage downstream. No, I mean, are there any like safety measures already in place before putting the EMP shield in? Or is it like if your house gets struck by lightning, um, does your generator get fried as well if you don't have an EMP shield? Well, you need to put one on there. That's that's, the that's what I'm asking. Is well, it, I know would it one, already get destroyed? I would I would put one. Well, if it got struck by lightning. You yeah. Know, I mean, yeah, but th that's one cool thing. That's why I sought them out. Okay. was specifically the fact that you wouldn't even have to, all you have to do if that thing ever gets, now a lightning strike, it's only good for one time. So when it blows that thing off the wall, which had happened in Kansas, all you do, it didn't fry anything downstream. And if it does, if you have any damage, their guarantee is so great that I, I don't, I think it's up to $30,000 they'll replace. You don't even have to go to your insurance or anything like it. So that's good. Yeah. That's one cool. It's, your transient voltage surge suppressors out there, I've installed these things forever and a day as a journeyman wireman or a journeyman electrician is what most people will call it, has nowhere near the guarantee that this thing does. And that's, I, I didn't mean to make this an EMP shield commercial, but the point of it being, to answer your question, yes, this thing is the cat's meow. It's the reason I went to them. Like I said, advertisers don't come to me, y'all. If it's not something I don't use, you're not ever going to hear about it. But also, remember, you can get 50 bucks off on that thing with promo code PERMA, P-E-R-M-A. Also, we got Harvest Right freeze dryers. You can see that in the description box down below. And don't forget to tip a pimp on the fountain app. Yep. Hashtag tip a pimp. Tell everybody. All right, Hashtag we'll catch Jack was running for a while. People kind of seem to... They ran, They stopped using that one after a while. Well, the Jack he's talking about is the one that told me about it, Jack Spearco, which I'm going to talk about him a little later in the program today. Um, yeah, check us out on the Fountain app. The cool thing about that is if you like what we're doing, you can tip us. You can also, one cool thing that I love about the Fountain app is you can listen to all your podcasts over there. And on that podcast app, the really awesome thing is if you're like me and you take in a lot of media in the course of a day, not so much as of late, but... If you do take in a lot of media, um, I'd sometimes triple the speed. I want I want to speed it up because I'm not caring, depending on the podcast, you know, how um, 
you know, I'm not trying to be lost in the moment. I just want the right. information because a lot of it is informational type podcasts and sing, things of that nature. So tip of the day, and he's probably going to laugh about it, is pick the right coach. Now, okay, so here's... <laughs> Which part, Dad? <laughs> yeah, you, I'll get to that in a minute. You'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. So for days and days and days, folks, up until now, those of you that have been with us from the very beginning have heard the Gap Band early in the morning. I love this song. I think it fits the podcast. I think it fits the weather pimp cast. I think everything about it just fits the show. It's upbeat. It just works, uh, at least in my opinion. And um, with moving over to YouTube, there's going to be copyright issues. So we've been going like the Hatfields and McCoys trying to figure out exactly how to go about this. And, um, and then all of a sudden your mom, for those that don't know, Michelle, she said, today, why don't you just reach out to Matt, meaning Matt Huddenly, <laughs> um, over at... Um, Was it Homestead for a Living Homestead now? for a Living, yeah. You can find that on YouTube. Go check them out. They're doing awesome things. Um, yeah, Matt's a professional musician. And I've been sitting here beating my head against the wall 30, day, 30 ways to Sunday, called up Jack Spearco. Me and him talked for about an hour about... I initially called him about this issue, he being in this space forever in the day would obviously know where all the bodies are buried. And then at the end of the day, it was like, reach out to Matt because he is a doggone professional musician and he would almost certainly know how to go about doing this. So when I say pick the right coach, here I am. I'm good at what I do. Um, in some ways, I might even be exceptional. In other ways, I might be marginal, maybe not so wonderful. Here's one area where I'm less than marginal. And this is where you got to hire the coaches out there, folks. And what that may mean for you is maybe it's a, a permaculture design. Like from Eric Sider. Yeah, yeah. From not, <laughs> Yeah, we're up to our eyeballs. Uh, you want the very best out there. Eric Sider is the best at giving you what you need in that regard. So, um, yeah, you can check him out. We need to really give his, put his contact information down below if you uh, aren't already. It was at one point. I don't know if it still is. <laughs> But yeah, it, it was at one point. I know for sure for that, do you need a consultation uh, episode that we did not too long ago? Probably ought to put it back in there. But yeah, so you pick the right coach for, let's say, exa for example, let's say you're a plumber, okay? Or you're a nurse. Well, you're not a permaculture designer yet, although everybody ought to be out there. And people ask me, what book should I read all the time? First thing I'm going to tell people is go get a permaculture design certificate. And then it's going to help guide you. Like William always says, you're going to find out what answer, what questions you need to ask. Yeah. Well, in the case of something like this, look, I don't know anything about copyright stuff. I don't, I barely know anything about music. Almost never listen to music anymore because I'm listening to podcasts half the time. And, um, you know, so here it is. I got on speed dial, a guy who is a professional musician records in studios what almost, and did know exactly what to do. So, I said all that to say, A, number one, well, number one, we're going to try to find ways to get the Gap Band music back because that's what I dig, and I think it works for the reasons I cited earlier. And also, um, you know, maybe not only can we get that, if we don't get that, I got a really awesome option B of somebody who professionally will hook us up with a serious montage. That's good. Yeah. Dad, let's get into the farm news. We well, got some exciting farm news today. Yeah, well, everybody <laughs> I think knows by now. Okay, so you want to tell them? Yeah, we got two baby lambs out there. And one of them's a bottle baby, which is kind of the bad news part. Uh, one of them's a bottle baby, but it's a it's a ram. So it could potentially be a, a benefit. Um, the other lamb that we have is a girl, and she seems to be just, just fine. That seems, she, man, that girl's leaping, yeah, and galloping. She's, she's nursing on both mothers, but the, the mother of the ram that we have, she kind of rejected him. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's, he's, he was probably premature. Well, he's definitely premature. Uh, and she just kind of let him go and she didn't even have any milk ready when he was born yet. Yeah. He's like half the size. He probably should have came out a week later. Yeah. Somebody even said so in the YouTube comments. Um, yeah, he was definitely premature, but your mom had him out there. You know, I said, you know, they're basically, nobody's harming him, harming him down there. Well, well they did. They kind of pushed him around yeah. when you, so it, it's just part of the reindeer games, man. He's just going to have to deal with it. Yeah, so all you vegans out there that say they want animals to have a natural death, natural death is a lot more violent than uh, what we provide. That's Bam, for dog, son, I'm sure. That, that lamb would 
uh, would starve down there and get rammed to death, basically. Yeah, that that is an excellent point because if we didn't intervene, well, that's the alternative. And then you got to be also asking yourself, okay, um, wow, he was premature. He's starting to get. It, I mean, just to get him to get on the bottle was hard enough. Yeah, I mean, he's on. But the good news is that he's on the bottle. He's in, he's drinking like one to. I don't know, two and a half ounces at a time. That feeding last night I gave him, he was chugging. Yeah. But so he's going from like barely any milk to one to two and a half ounces at a time. And he's up and like exploring. He's up and running. Well, he's a little shaky on his feet. And then it's like the more he does it, the more he's been following your mom around. And she's calling him baby. Yep. So, so. yeah. And then check <laughs> this out right now before we started recording this podcast. Y'all, I walk into my bedroom, my bedroom. <laughs> And it looks like something straight out of Dr. Doolittle. There's a dog. There's a feral cat that's in heat making all this racket. And then there's a sheep in the room. So you give your mom yep. an inch, man. She will take a mile. I, I said, look, you know this. <laughs> he ain't staying the night. He ain't getting in this bed. Yeah. And if it was up to your mom, I guarantee that sheep would be sleeping in that bed. Thank God I'm not out of town. He's a cute little lamb. He's cute, but he ain't <laughs> about to jump in my bed. And that's exactly. So she's doing. She does something of a, with every single thing as it pertains to an animal, your mom is actually a closet Fabian socialist. Okay, like under the Fabian socialist model, they use a method called gradualism, okay? So they don't overnight just change your currency. They do it over a period of time, so you barely, it's like the frog in a boiling pot, okay? <laughs> like the lamb is already in the garage. We might as well bring it in the house. Yeah, so then it goes from the garage <laughs> to the bathroom, to and the then bedroom. to the bedroom <laughs> and then I go in there and she's got this blanket laid out and I'm like, what's all that about? I'm like, why ain't he in this box? Oh, well, you know, I'm like, oh no, you got to put him in that box. He ain't about to pee all over this floor. So, and then she has a nerve to get upset with me about it. Like, are you kidding me? He's a cute little lamb. He's got some curly, curly hair. Yeah, he is cute. Um, two of them definitely don't have the same daddy. No. Um, but yeah, the other one was twice that size galloping, doing, all, I mean, you name it, man. That thing is absolutely, absolutely at a full run. I mean, running up and down the paddock and everything. But the cool thing is, is that the only one we can't breed him with is the, his mom, basically. If we were to breed him, and we can also trade him with, like, Ben and Denise and get some dis different genetics and stuff like that. Um, I mean, he has good genetics. He just, this, the mom was the first time mom. She was probably bred, bred too way young too early and that's what happened so there's nothing wrong with necessarily the genetics we don't think we'll know around like the second time we try yeah um but i mean he's still a good ram yes well we'll see i mean his his body condition is kind of hard to tell right now but it doesn't look wonderful it doesn't look bad i mean he's not built like a hot rod like uh no samson was no man i mean the the cool thing about this is that that's part of what we're trying to do also is that, I mean, I know um, Nate over at the Kramer life, he was hitting me up about borrowing the Ram and I'm like, dude, we don't even have this one yet, but you know, this Ram almost certainly ain't going to be able to stay here because we were thinking, you know, yeah. Ben and Denise had offered their Ram, which we might end up taking. That's the cool thing about building these communities. Well, these that's the cool thing about sheep. Is that they're small enough to easily like uh, yes, move around exactly. and stuff. Exactly. You could put them in a dog crate and get them where you got to go. And the cool thing about that, y'all, when you have a, um, a group of friends, homesteaders, and you don't necessarily live that far, that's why you every, everybody, myself included, needs to get right back into going to like freesteading.com to where all of us get off of this. Um, like somebody hit me up about birds and where you go to buy them and stuff. Yeah. Well, Right now, just in within an hour from the ground I'm st sitting on right now, we got Ben and Denise, who we could cross genetics with. Yep. We got Nate at the Kramer Life, we could cross genetics with. And there's a handful of other people around here that almost certainly would, wouldn't would mind crossing. Now, keep in mind that you got to have the same practices. Right. I mean, you can't drop somebody off at a feedlot or drop your animal off at a place that has a feedlot, you know. Or where, but I know these people, and I know they're they're doing the best they can to keep after these guys. But you know, the cool thing about that is that we may have spent the money to get these really great genetics, and we're picking up the ram next week. Yeah. Well, everybody we know could be the beneficiary of that. 
So here it is with all these different flocks. That's the beauty about doing all this. <laughs> the stuff. ram doesn't mind. <laughs> no, ram's like, oh, okay. But like you said, the difference, first of all, you're going to produce way more meat off of a breeding pair of sheep than you ever would on a cow in the same period of time. Yep. Um, it's, I mean, if it, granted, if you're not doing things right, yeah, you could have some issues. If your genetics ain't right, you could have some issues. And I have every intention to cull heavily because I'm not trying to have a petting zoo. And that's one of the hardest things for people. That's probably a podcast we really ought to talk about because that's one of the hardest things that people are going to have a problem with. Like with him, he's almost certainly not going to be able to stay here. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Walter, one of our uh, Rams out there right now, he's going to be staying. And then the one we get is going to be staying. But who's to say they can't, we can't farm everything out. Yeah. So you could essentially do the spiral mating method with chicken propagation, but with sheep. We just well, need to take copious. Would that work? Well, uh, you got three different flocks is what I'm saying. Okay. You got to have a minimum of three. So we all got different genetics. And if we can cross it up and if everybody culls heavily, huh? Not a bad yeah. idea. Not a bad place to be. So, folks, the reason why I'm even pointing this out and spending so much time on it is these are the things we're going to have to get re really good at. Because really, at the end of the day, when you add all this up, look, this isn't a doom and gloom podcast, but let's be real. I mean, Jack Spearco is doing a program today, and what was he talking about? It was like, okay, so if everything just falls apart today in America, even though it's a survival podcast, he doesn't do a whole lot of programs like that. But he's talking what America is going to look like if this thing falls apart. And I think we're past the if part of that quotient. Yeah. I really do. So when it jumps off, we don't have to sit here and try to figure these things out. Just like Jack always says, it's a way to live if times get tough or even if they don't. Man, I love that tagline because – it's so absolutely true. We need to set these things up right now, now that we have what Salatin calls a homesteading tsunami. Well, we'll also notice a lot less when things fall apart if we already have the communities put in place. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if we all have our flocks where, you know what, not everybody's going to want to get into cows or have the land for it. Yeah. Not everybody's going to have land like us. Most people are going to be working within... I mean, let's be honest here. Many people are going to be within a city lot. Okay, within that, what can you do? You can do chickens for sure. Well, yeah, but even you could still potentially even do sheep. And Absolutely. it's it's much easier to convince people, hey, let me graze these cute little sheep around your house instead of like, hey, let me bring this massive bull over and let's hope he doesn't leave massive hoof prints in your yard after it rains. I, you just took the words right out of my mouth. So let's say you got... Um, Let's say you got a neighborhood and you got a coalition of the willing, so to speak. And you were to go down there, hey, Miss Johnson, instead of you mowing that yard or hiring that kit or whatever, you ain't hiring a kid these days. Yeah. Instead of hiring that service, why don't you let me have my sheep go down there, fertilize this for you, and then all you do is house them back at night. You could yeah. have a thing going there. I mean, you could, okay, so people got brambles out there. Let's say you got a goat business. There were some old boys in Texas around the Dallas area doing that very same thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't copy that that method, though, because yeah, they're parking either. on the side of interstates in Texas. I remember when we first moved to Texas, it was still in the, like, or I can't remember when it was, like, in relation to when we moved to Texas. But I remember it was the beginning of the year. We were only a couple, like, maybe a month and a half in a, into the year. And you know those big orange signs that it had, they have above the interstates, and that gives you, like, traffic information? They gave you the total deaths for that year so far, and it was in the 2000s. Wow. On Texas roads. Texas well, roads, not United well, States. Well, there's a reason why when we moved to Texas, our insurance tripled, and then when we left, it went way down. I had guys, I don't mean to get too far off track, but I was working with guys back there that bragged about the number of accidents they had been in. Yeah. Just, I mean, lunacy. Um, but let's get back on track. When it comes to... Let's say you're, I mean, most people live in, a, let's say, a city lot or whatever the case may be. That's the majority of America. Or let's say you have a little bit more. Well, how many of those lots of your neighbors could you possibly graze? I mean, you could really do right. that. Um, you might be able to take a whole gang of them out there and graze. I mean, especially in the front yard. What are they going to do? Tell them your sheep identifies dogs. That's what we always say, right? Yep. All right, y'all. Before we get into Pastor Lon, I want to make sure everybody is aware out there that um, we have a butchery class coming up really soon. We're going to leave the information down below. A lot of people are blowing me up about that. We're going to do two different dates. It's going to be teaming up with So the Land. 
Um, one date is, it's all going to start in the end of April, as I recall. So on one weekend, you'll have to pick which one you want to go to unless you want to go to both. One weekend, we're going to uh, skin a pig, and the other, we're going to scald the pig. And, um, yeah, we're going to get all that done. And it looks like we'll be doing some pig, or at least I will, uh, this weekend as well. With that said, we're going to move right into homesteading pastor himself, Pastor Lon. Or not. Yeah, I don't I have no idea why this is not playing right now. This should be hooked up to the uh, Bluetooth, but for some reason it's not. So, okay. yeah, it is definitely hooked up to the Bluetooth. Well, it's a technical difficulty that we are just going to move on beyond that. Here we go. Let's try it again. Hello, everyone. This is Pastor Lon. I feel like as believers, our desire should be a more powerful prayer life. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I feel like these scriptures try and encourage us to not to be anxious or worry about anything, but to pray about everything with thanksgiving in our heart as we make our petitions to God Almighty, our requests known unto Him, and He'll give us the peace of mind that the world just can't understand. He'll also keep our hearts and minds through His Son, Jesus Christ. Well, you got to give a straight up amen to all that. Every yeah. single time Pastor Lon drops some, you know, serious manhole covers on, and it always, <laughs> not only does he drop them on my head, but it's also also something that can always apply I'm like, huh, okay, I can relate to that, absolutely. All right, y'all, we're going to get into the bad news, good news section. For every one bad news, we give you two good. So, um, and and folks, if you think for a minute that this doesn't apply in your life or what's going on, it does. I and mean, you're thinking, what does it have to do with permaculture preparedness and practical living? I guarantee you everything I say is somewhere in that trifecta. So right off the bat, here we go, son. We got another train carrying 30,000 gallons of propane that derails in Florida, Manatee County. How many is that now? I don't even, what's the, Ohio? Was it Texas? South Carolina? What was that, Florida? Florida. I, I don't even know now. I mean, this went from not being a thing that we heard about on the news to now it happens almost weekly. Yeah, I mean. Kind of like you, mass shootings? Huh, how about that? Yeah. It almost seems as if, like right now, it almost seems as if, and, you know, call me conspiracy theory for this, but it almost seems contrived. You know, I will say this. <laughs> almost. <laughs> I, I will say this, that, you know, ever since, now I, will, I can't believe I never said it on this podcast, ever since that James O'Keefe expose oh, of yeah, that yeah. guy yeah. Pfizer. Yep. First of all, in a moment's time, they scrubbed that dude's entire life from the internet. They made him disappear. Yeah. They also, he also got kicked out of his own company. How about that? Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that fruitcake, all of a sudden that happens. And then right on the heels of it, when people are really starting to pay attention, we got balloons floating across the United States. Yeah. Then when that wears off, we got the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And as more and more people seem to wake up, I think the, I think it's going to scale up. I would almost bet money on the fact that as, and I think I think it's only backfiring because more and more and more people are waking up. Yeah, people who wouldn't have said anything before about this are actually now speaking out against, like, okay, so there's a couple of podcasts, or one particular podcast I listen to, and it's just a comedy podcast. It's just comedians talking, and it's just a funny, easy, laid-back thing to talk about. They definitely don't talk about what's going on in the world and now they're talking about this whole covid nonsense myocarditis uh masks don't work and all that stuff now they're even talking well, about how about that yeah. i mean it's only it's only going to get crazier y'all and sadly remember what i told y'all in the beginning of this podcast the only way to wake up a decadent society is the crucible of really hard times and you're starting to see that. And I think it's only going to ramp up a little bit more. All right, y'all. Good news. Boost your health, your immune health, with um, straight up with uh, ginger. Um, 
Okay, I'm, I'm pointing this out because it really applies to so many different things. Now, this article is concerning ginger. But how much stuff do we have out there in the food forest and the orchard that was grown specifically as medicine, not only for the, well, if it, your mom's involved, oh, yeah. first of all, the animals, and then us. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. Um, there, mo- most of what is planted ba- down there has a medicinal value to some extent. Right, but that's the whole purpose why it was put in there. But they're talking about the benefits of ginger. Yeah. Everything from the comfrey we grow to you name it out there, there is all a medicinal purpose. So, yeah, they're pointing out ginger, but I saw this article and I'm like, ding, 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 ding. Every time we we take a piece of that garden, we'll take something out of there, especially in the you know when it's vegetative, and it's going to go to the animals. I guarantee, I guarantee you, every single day, those chickens and sheep are eating comfrey every single day. Well, when we have it, well, like, that's what I mean. When it's vegetative, yeah, when it's vegetative, and every single, and we still can't grow enough of it. Which, right? I did, I wasn't meaning this to be an ad, but we do have more in stock if anybody wants it. Um. And then it looks like we're going to wind up running out. Yeah, I mean, it looks like we're going to wind up running out very quickly. I just checked the orders not too long ago. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> it's going to run out, but we'll we'll have to get more, y'all. We're getting a harvest much earlier than we ever dreamed of. Right. We were expecting the end of March. William went out there, looked around, and like, oh, heavens to Murgatroyd, this stuff is kicking right now. So, yeah, I wanted to make sure I got that one out there. So, even, you know, all these things, you can use them for so many different things. Not only are they might be insectary, um, medicinal purpose, they look pretty. It could be that too. It could all, all you know, be all of the above. But grow a lot of that medicine at home. And these things, you know, the allopathic medical industry is never going to tell you about it or even care about it. Yeah. So, yeah, grow this stuff yourself. Not necessarily ginger per se, but there's tons of stuff out there that you can grow and easily put it in there. It could even be in your front yard where even if you're in the HOA, you know, well, you know, tell them, Hey, this comfrey identifies as grass. Yeah. I don't think Why they'll not? have an issue with comfrey though. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, you never know, man. I mean, this stuff's getting crazier and crazier. All right. The other good news section, and people are going to think I need my head examined. If I need to, I'll, I'll hit it more when we come back after the break. But, um, the guy, Scott Adams from Dilbert, did you hear about the comment that he made? No. Yeah, man. He went on this rant <laughs> And I'm telling you what, that dude must have kishkas the size of matzo balls. Um, he well, got on there. Those pretty small. <laughs> well, well, okay, maybe not. Okay, basketballs. I didn't mean to say. My, yeah, I, I didn't mean to talk. I was thinking about Joe Biden. He he said, um, based on the current way things are going, the best advice I would give white people is get the hell away from black people. Now he said this, Dang. and it came down on him like a ton ton of bricks as a racist. But I agree with him. And here's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yeah. Here's exactly what I'm talking about. He's not meaning all black people. Of course, he might have, you know, made that distinction. He he was speaking extemporaneously. So believe me, if anybody can relate, we can. You know, maybe it didn't come out the way he intended. And he's like, hey, get in your own neighborhood, man. Get out of a black neighborhood. What does every pro athlete do, son? How many of them do you think is in a black neighborhood? Uh, none. In fact, they all talk about it. <laughs> how many, okay. How many black celebrities are in a black neighborhood? Very few. The only people I would say that are black celebrities that stay in the bad neighborhoods are rappers and they shouldn't. <laughs> and nine times out of 10 Snoop Dogg ain't living in no. Yeah. 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 So the point being, man, I, I, I honestly, seriously thought about doing an entire podcast on this and I might, and I might, um, what really bugs me about this is, I'll be honest with you, the highest level of criticism I've ever received doing farm work has historically come from black people. I mean, mocking. I mean, absolutely yeah. mocking me for what I do because I grow food as if I'm stupid. You know what? We're going to cover, this ain't the topic, son, but we're going to cover more of this when we come back from the break. All right, so I'm going to get back to it. I mean, this, you know, I hit this on the edge of a break, y'all. And um, 
the truth of it is, man, I don't know how to say this. I, I'm, I'm not, trust me, I'm not couching my language because I'm worried about what somebody thinks. I don't, um, unless I'm seriously wrong. But frankly, I agree with the guy. You know, in black America, what is it? 11 to 12% of America is black, but somehow we're responsible for 90% of the crime. Now, I can give you historical examples as to how this all started under LBJ and the Great Society and all that kind of stuff, because up until then, the numbers were not even... In fact, white statistics historically were much worse in terms of crime and things like that. A lot of this has been done intentionally. But let's look at where we are right now when it comes to um, a lot of black folks in the inner city. I mean... It, it floors me. I mean, this has always been something that always just drove me crazy. So you'd have this really nice car, but you're living in a hovel that's fallen in around itself. Or you have this really nice, okay, how many times in Kansas City would we drive through there and at every bus stop, yeah, you got people dressed in thousands of dollars worth of clothing, but you're taking the city bus to get around. It was like, look, there's some serious problems, and I'm sure Scott Adams didn't, um, I'm sure he didn't say, or maybe he did. I mean, but truth is, it's the truth. Yeah. He's right. I mean, this ain't going to make me a popular person by saying this sort of thing, and frankly, I don't care. It's the truth. In fact, when I used to, back when I did talk radio, a lot of the black people, the big, cons um, how do I say it? the biggest criticism they would give me is like, you're airing dirty laundry. Well, go wash it. Okay, I'm airing dirty laundry. Then maybe you need to do the laundry. Here's one thing that a lot of white people aren't aware of in the black communities. And what's being taught in black communities is how to get over on white people. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. 100% guaranteed. Okay. How many times did, did those kids in Oklahoma City try to steal my bike? Yeah. 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 And dad was, I'm a little kid, obviously. I'm not going to pick up on this Well, you stuff. were much smaller. We were at the, we were at a lake one time and uh, you were riding your bike and you had a little Game Boy at the time. Those are, oh, those are two separate instances. Yeah. I'm talking about that cul-de-sac and Mustang. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, talking were, about that part. Oh, yeah. 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 They were trying to, um, yeah, so it was like. They are, many are taught by their parents, get over every single way you can. And now that they're playing this white guilt to the hilt and telling these poor kids, oh, you're guilty of this, this, and this because of the color of your skin. Well, like the guy, like Scott Adams said, you know, it sounds to me like when he was looking at these poll numbers, he's like, well, it sounds like a racist group. And he's right. And if you're black listening to this, you as well should get out. <laughs> well, you know what? I know. And, and I, this is the only criticism I would have is that he didn't make any distinctions. He didn't make those distinctions. Um, I grew up in a black neighborhood. And back in those days in that part of Pennsylvania, people were generally still this thug culture didn't make its way into to the world just yet. So everybody spoke the King's English. They speak as well as I do. In fact, I'm sure many do to this day. Last time we went through there, I, I didn't even recognize the place. Um, good night. I mean, it was like I was in downtown Calcutta. Trash everywhere. I mean, it was a complete mess. And so, yes, everything Scott Adams, had it been said by a black person, and it has Don Lemon for crying out loud, if it had been said by a black person, there been you wouldn't have heard a whisper of it. But because a white guy pointed out what is painfully obvious, now all of a sudden, look, the truth is truth no matter who says it. And honestly, I am, y'all, you have no idea how sick I am of hearing all this idiotic claim of you're a bigot, you're a racist. I'm going to tell you straight. Anybody wants to know my history, I guess, you know, I gave a little bit of it on what, what was that episode? The permaculture pimp daddy. Yeah. And I wish I wouldn't have left out this part and it's critical. I have witnessed my, myself personally, I have witnessed more overt bigotry from black people than I ever have from white people. That is a fact. Okay. You don't like what I'm saying? Well, you don't have to listen, but it's a fact. And I am a, quote, brown person. I mean, 
if you're watching me on YouTube right now or whatever platform you're seeing me on. <laughs> we might be slightly blue right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're watching me right now, you know, and like I said before, when I was growing up being a person of mixed race to at that time in America, it was very different. And especially that part of Oklahoma um, to white people, you were black and the black people, you weren't black enough. So it was, it was this weird place for me growing up. But I will say that I have by far witnessed far more bigotry at the hands of black people than I ever have at the hands of anybody else. Well, except maybe some Native Americans well, back there. Or Asians. Yeah, well, Asians there was hate that. Asians. <laughs> and there ain't no change in that. <laughs> Man. <laughs> yeah, Koreans and Japanese, bro. You don't. It's, that's not it. Well, dude, I was working on this job one time. This dude named Rob. Crazy as a three headed cat, dude. Rob. There's this engineer out there. It's working at a Hyundai place or Toshiba, mm-hmm. something out of Korea, right? Rob, this dude must have been about six foot six. And he was just the life of the party kind of guy, you know? And he tells this Korean engineer, he keeps breaking his chops. He's like, hey, man, you know, I need you to do this. Rob had finally had enough, man. He says, look, man. I, I, he didn't know what this guy's nationality was. And when I say nationality, I'm talking like nation. He didn't know where he came from. He just had enough of it. He says, look, man, I've been doing this job for 25 years. Should I go tell you how to do your job? He says, tell me how to do your job. And, and he said something like, well, okay, should I show you how to make the next Godzilla movie? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, good night. <laughs> and... He was like, like, it's just close enough. Like, yeah. I mean, like, well, this dude was Korean. Well, Godzilla was Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> and the enmity between those two. Oh, my goodness, man. Yeah. Well, that didn't end well. But anyway, that was a funny little side note. But point being, this was not, well, first of all, this was not at all the topic I got written down no. in my notes here, y'all. So I guess that's, this is just going to be the topic. I mean, we can change it. We can do whatever we want. It's the pimp cast. Well, I mean, like, and then the other example, when he was a baby growing up, he was the best baby in the world, y'all. I mean that. Uh, sweet as can be. Just loved everybody. And um, I remember we were out at a lake near Oklahoma City, and it was the same thing all over. Their parents are over there, or parent. That's part of the yeah. problem. Yeah. That's part of the problem. Not to say there ain't, you know, single parents, but you know, there's a reason why, what is it? What was the latest number? I think it was an 80 upper to 88% or 85% of black kids in America are born out of wedlock. Well, and then you wonder why you ever wonder why any of these pro athletes, when they get an award or they thank anybody, they always thank their mom name one that's ever thanked his dad. Kanye was okay. Uh, Tiger Woods. <laughs> yeah. Tiger Woods outside of those two, they're always thanking their mom. Look, oh my goodness, man. Read Jesse Lee, Jesse Lee Peters' book. Um, believe it or not, Juan Williams, before he got on the Fox News, he was far more conservative than he lets on to be today. But he wrote a book, and I read it. I can't remember the name of it right now. He was pushing out all these awful statistics. And then all of a sudden, he seemed to make... I know it, This is how I know the news, at least on Fox and everybody else, is fake because he was polar opposite based on what he wrote. I read his books yeah. way back when I got the books on the shelf somewhere around here, but every single statistic in America is absolutely dreadful, absolutely dreadful. And then the thing that really burns me up, like at this last conference we did the last weekend. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know where I'm going with this. Yep. We talked about it briefly uh, in the last pip cast where I was not keen on going to this thing because there was a little segment the last time I was there of like farming while black. And then all these white people in the audience, there were some black and brown people in the audience out there. And they're like shaking their head, like in agreement, like, yeah, we deserve all these reparations and everything. And I'm like, okay, I, I, the, the most thing I was most upset son about is that I didn't stand up and do what I had every intention of doing. And I was like, okay, I hear all because I sat through the class to even think if you ask your mom, I sat through this class just to even find out if it was real. I thought they were punking people. I'm like, there ain't no way. And then all these, the lady who was doing the class was saying, you need to be. And then all the white people are like, huh? Yeah, we ought to give our, I'm like, what? Ask South Africa how that's going right now. Yeah. 
<laughs> but you know what? If this is if this is how it goes, okay, with the reparations, then okay, everybody in Europe needs to needs to go to Italy and demand reparations for being slaves. When the Roman Empire ruled this planet. Well, not just Europe. <laughs> I mean, part of North Asia, Africa. part of Africa. Yeah. yeah. Everybody go back to Europe. So, oh, yeah. Go hit up the Vatican. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they ask got them, it. Yeah. They ask got it. for their reparations. Yeah. You'll get it out of Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They got the money. Um, a whole lot more there, too. But the point being is if you want to pull this reparations thing, where does it stop? I mean, don't, man, don't even get me started on the whole slave thing. And we got... What does it say right now? Look, I'll put it in a nutshell. When I can say the number one source of the bigotry in my life has almost, I'll try to put it in percent. Yeah. I'd say 75% of any bigotry I've ever experienced in my life was from black people. The nastiest yeah. criticism for being a farmer from black people. Now, I want to also say that there are, are definitely, assuredly, some of the finest people on earth, and some of which I know that are black. And that's where I think Dilbert kind of screwed, not Dilbert, but Scott Adams, I think yeah. that's where he kind of screwed up, is that he didn't make any distinctions. Um, because it's not, he would probably be okay in the company of somebody, you know, that isn't the typical thug waiting on a bus stop in Kansas City. Right. You know, the guy... Give me five dollars, man. Like what? I remember going through with um, my buddy Troy, and I remember <laughs> they tried to shake him down. Ain't nobody shaking Troy down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they tried to shake him down because he's a red-haired white guy. Redneck is all get out. I mean, he's the kind of guy you drop off in the woods and he'll come out gaining weight. <laughs> and um, you know, they thought they were going to pull this you know, bully this guy because he's a red haired white guy and they did not like the way that turned out. <laughs> so, and I, I'm not going to repeat how that went down, but the point of it being is that the guy is making a colossal point. I don't let, you couldn't pay me to live in a black neighborhood. No, you absolutely couldn't. not. We moved to near Asheville. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, and then half the people in Asheville are complaining because there aren't enough black people around. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> be careful. I mean. So they hurried, they hurried up and got that reparations thing knocked out before they all yeah, moved Yeah, before here. black people moved here. Like, oh, Asheville's where I need to go. It's a whole line of five people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, be careful what you wish for. And I'm not saying that. Okay, I'm going to tighten that up a little bit and make sure people understand what I'm saying. Black people are wonderful. But Chris Rock even did a skit on that where he yeah. said, I love black people, but I hate the N word that was Chris rock. And then go and listen to that comedy skit of what he descri describes as the N word. And it's everything. Everybody universally hates. Yeah. Everything. Uh, who John Witherspoon. He also yeah. had a thing about that. Talking yeah. about the same exact thing. Same. And how every culture has them. Yep. He said, <laughs> yep. You got them in every race. He said, you call them a different name, but then, <laughs> yeah, he's like, he said, you got a different name for him, but it's the same exact thing. So now you got every, you got some of these sanctimonious black folks on their high horse with Chris Rock. Hey, it's recorded, bro. I heard what you said. And you did this years ago. Do you know how many people are on the other end of this? Like Palpatine, like do it. <laughs> do, do it. it. <laughs> <laughs> people are just, man, will you just go ahead and say it? Say that N word just one time. I might just go ahead and do it, man. Yeah, my voice was working out a little bit better. I might go ahead and take it, knock the mothballs off of it. Because honestly, as far as that word goes, go to a basketball game. Go to a college yeah. or professional basketball game. How many times do you hear that word thrown around? I wonder what would have happened if Larry Bird said it. <laughs> In your face. <laughs> All right. No. We don't have to worry about monetization anymore. <laughs> well, no. I mean, <laughs> point of it being, I mean, I guess we got to find some way to laugh about all this. But I'm sick and tired of people saying, or the one I hate, is I used to get called an Uncle Tom because, and I, I talked about it briefly. What The part I didn't talk about in that one episode was um, the ones who would criticize me. I, t I said, Mr. Pendarvis, I got in his class, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. I was making straight A's. 
the ones that were criticizing me. You what are you white? Well, what does that say of you? Because I'm getting straight A's that I'm trying to act white. Your name is Billy. You must be white. I'm like, what about Billy Sims? Or the fact that your name is, well, it's William. Yeah. Okay. Which is even whiter. Thank you very much. But, uh, <laughs> you don't hear any English guys named Billy or maybe they do. I don't know. I've yeah. Never... I'm sure there's a bunch of black English people named William. I'm, I'm sure, sure that are. is a very popular name for black guys in, in England. Yeah. Could very well be. But the point of it being is that right here, you know, that's another thing. Where are the Jesse Jacksons in England? Where are the Al Sharptons in England? I've never even heard about it, but we only got those parasites here, you know, sucking on the flesh of everybody in their own. But look, man, I can't even believe I went down this road. I think they go visit. I don't think they stay just in the United States. I think they go visit other countries. Yeah, but stuff. I'm saying, where where is their version of it? You don't hear about these people. I mean, that you know, these uh, grifters are only hanging out right here in the United States of Amnesia, I guess. But look, y'all, this is not at all... <laughs> They're where in, I intended to go. They're in Parliament. <laughs> they made it to Parliament in England. <laughs> yeah, they literally speak the King's English. Father, tell me of the days, with William. I was hoping that I'd someday that I would get so rich, make so much money, that you would be raised as something of an aristocrat, and you would someday come to me and say, "Father, tell me of the days when you lived as a." <laughs> did you eat government cheese <laughs> did you sag your pants Dad, father people are dying waiting for you to say it man they, they thought i was gonna was it uncomfortable growing up as a <laughs> dude everybody's thinking what there ain't nothing about this that has anything to do with permaculture yes it does here's i'll go ahead and do this and then we'll get into the q a in a sec reason why this is important, the reason I'm talking about it right now, is some of the worst places where you're going to deal with this super wokeness where you're laying hat in hand for black people is in the permaculture space. I recently did an interview with Seth Holhouse. I don't even know if he's ever going to air that one, but um, I did an interview with Seth. And, um, you know, I, I basically said that some of the biggest enclaves of hardcore fall over yourself kind of liberalism is going to be in the permaculture space. Yeah. That's why we are exceptionally rare. Number one, to be people of color in this space. And at the same time, um, very Liberty minded, which is the polar opposite of from most of the permaculture people that I know personally. Um, I don't, I don't know too many others that are, I mean, that live in the Liberty sense outside of Jack Spearco. And if Matt they and are, Gaddy. if they are, they don't call it permaculture. A lot of them don't. Well, Jack yeah. has no problem calling it permaculture. Right. But at the end of the day, the the biggest thing I want to point out is that, yeah, I guess to a certain extent this applies in permaculture because some of the biggest wokey woke wokers are in the permaculture space. So now, folks, I want you to be a little more armed out there. And I mean black folks and white folks. In fact, black folks, if you're listening, you know everything I said was true. Yep. Everything I said was true. And... um if you're listening, obviously, to this podcast in the first place, you know that it doesn't apply to you. So, um, yeah. So, Scott Adams, I feel for you, nephew, because they're coming <laughs> after you, bro. <laughs> well that that was definitely a fitting song yes, i didn't it was. <laughs> I, I had no idea it was going to come in that Cue way it was clap already, track <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that was that was absolutely positively uh, totally fitting with what we're talking about. Apparently, you got something right out of the gate, so. Oh, I was yeah, I do. Uh, I got one from Merlin. Man, freeze dried banana slices are the best. Also, freeze drying excess eggs is a great thing to do. Got mom listening to the podcast now. Hashtag tip a pimp. 
Thanks, Merlin. Oh, thanks, Merlin. <laughs> <laughs> well, mom's probably wondering, what did you have me yeah, tune into on this episode? <laughs> She's like, <laughs> hey, sorry, man. <laughs> mom's probably Even like. Even she's wanting you to say it. <laughs> yeah, she's like, well, you just go ahead and say it. Call him for crying out loud. Call him a straight up. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this is more fun than I thought I'd have. Um, yeah, as far as that freeze dried stuff, um, y'all, we're going to be talking more about it. There's a uh, freeze dried company that um, we might be making a deal with if the food tastes good and it's what it's supposed to be. So, right, yeah, yeah. that that's one of our next sponsors. But like I told y'all, um, um, I've heard wonderful things about them, so I ordered some of their stuff. I'm going to let you know how that goes mostly in the YouTube realm, I think, but we're definitely going to talk about it here, but we're going to try this stuff out for a serious test drive tomorrow. The only thing is jacked up. I ain't eating it. Yeah. And I ain't yeah. going to tell you all about it. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I don't like about the freeze dried banana slices is that they get stuck in your teeth forever. It like turns into, I don't know, but it just gets stuck into your I'm teeth. I'm not a big forever. fan of the bananas. I love really? the blueberries. Yeah. Of well, all the, yeah. Yeah. So if you got a freeze dryer, y'all, that's the best way to go about it. But if you can't, or you just don't have the time, Believe me, and you got to have it tomorrow because yeah. it does take time to build up the pantry when you're doing freeze drying. Even if you run that thing every single day, it's not a fast process. It does take some time depending or on what you got in it. If you have like a stock of canned goods and you're already squared away for like 25 years or yeah. something, if you already have that, then you can purchase this. And we got this idea from Seth Whole House. Yeah. Like purchase this stuff to give to other people. Or well, to a barter with other people. Yeah, it could be that. But also, it could supplement your own stores. Right. I mean, because honestly, you know, I'm going to go through some of my fresh stuff before I ever get into the freeze-dried stuff. Yeah. All right, I got one, man. <coughs> Excuse me, all the voice, you know. Um, Man, this one made my day. This was over on Patreon. Ms. Manley. <clears throat> so sorry, y'all. Um, Really poor form to clear my voice in front of a microphone, but I don't have a mute button. Anyway, um... Yeah, Ms. Manley, um, I'll break it down in a nutshell. She watched a lecture that we did on a college campus, and she said one thing resonated with me. I'm an elementary school teacher, and I'm trying to continue homesteading as my dad always did. We spent nearly 200 I guess, dollars on feed Saturday for our chickens and turkeys. Man, that's a lot of growth. How much was it? 200, 200 oh, bucks, okay. but I'm not sure how long that lasts. Uh, you talked about just getting mo milk from elementary schools thrown away, and I watched the other videos on feeding your animals for free, but I'm shy when it comes to asking restaurants. And then she says, you know, a thing I need to get out of, um, baby steps. So I thought about going to our cafeteria staff and get them about saving the food waste. So in a nutshell, check this out. One day, the produce filled an 18-gallon tote, and it wasn't even the spaghetti, the ham sandwich, or the milk waste, or any of that kind of stuff. And... Um, that's awesome. That is that is fantastic. Yeah. She gave me an idea, really, thinking, huh, maybe we ought to reach out to some of these elementary schools and do, I mean, this obviously I don't have the bandwidth to do this right now, but one of the things I was hoping to do was ultimately do this at schools, take their food waste, don't even leave the campus. Once we get this Earthship and all the other things done, then it's going to be projects like this where I try to, Get them as early as we possibly can because my earliest memory of farming was going to an orchard when I was in fourth or fifth. No, I think it was fourth grade. Yeah. Well, my first thought was thinking, okay, like with just that, that comment that you read, was that every school could potentially have its own closed loop system. Absolutely. Like they could all be potentially producing their own food. Like how many ag students, well, I don't even know how many ag students exist anymore in schools, but at the school, the high school that I went to, um, like the ag department was a big part of the school because it was a farming community. Right. Like there were plenty and the school had land. The school had plenty of land. I think most schools have like a decent amount of yes, land. Yes, they do. And they and it's just basically a grass parking lot for the most part. And even if it wasn't like enough to produce food for the entire school, if it could be supplementary or if it could be just a source of income to purchase, then purchase better food. How for about the school. a demonstration site? There's you're, that. you're saying you want to you want to sit here and indoctrinate these kids in so many different ways. I mean, I'm, Ms. Manley's obviously cut from a different cloth, and others right. like her. But the point of it being is that. You're saying you want to educate these kids. Well, what about a farm education? You know, right now at this point in my life, I got a military education. I got a trade education. I got a college education. 
and I got a farm education. An What's wrong with having an yeah. accessible farm education where you don't have to start out with thousands of acres? Yes. Yes. I mean, this could absolutely, this is something that once we not, yeah, we got a lot of things to get done, but once we get there, that's one of the things I really want to do that and start grazing the sides of highways and stuff. Yeah. Um, not in Texas though. No, sir. I got one from Evan Young. Uh, if I remember right, he's from Australia. I feel your pain, William. I was clearing scrub. Yep, he is from Australia. I was clearing scrub for a new fence line and was bitten by over 20 bullet ants at the same time here in Victoria, Australia. Each bite caused a welt the size of thumbnail, so painful too. I think I put a whole aloe vera I think I put aloe vera on it when I finally got home. These days we have a plantain tincture in our first aid kits. We apply it ASAP to any insect but insect bites as it is known to draw out the venom slash sting. Uh, thanks for the knife. We really appreciate customs and its challenges. Holy crap. They just now got that knife. Wow. Yeah, that, I'm not surprised. Remember whenever you and mom tried to send that care package over to me? Yeah. Yeah. And it never made it. Never to made it. And when I finally got a letter about it, I had like forgot a letter letting me know that beef jerky was not allowed in Australia. Um, that is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't get my head around that. We got one from uh, Kimberly. Uh, she's asking, is it too late to apply bone sauce? She's in central Alabama. Um, things are starting to bud a little bit. Will it kill the tree? She also has uh, blueberries. She wants to put it on. Okay. If you put it on the woody surfaces, whether it's a berry bush, whatever it is, if it's green, don't put it on there because it will wilt. It ain't yeah. going to kill it, but it's going to wilt it. So you want to, in best case scenario, no matter where you're putting bone sauce, whether it's on a tree or a shrub you definitely want to avoid the green areas. So that's why it's best to put it when the tree's dormant. You can do it afterwards. You're just going to have to kind of, you know, get through there with your paintbrush and stuff. Yeah. It's just you, but when it's not, you can just run that stuff down each branch. You know, it's not going to be a problem. But yeah, if it means not getting wiped out, I would absolutely put it on. I got one from Cheetah68. Check out Tingly Boots. Better than muck and less expensive. Cool. Tingly. tingly. I ain't wearing nothing called Tingly boot, man. <laughs> tingly. T-I-N-G-L-E-Y. I might be pronouncing it wrong, but I think I'm pretty sure it's Tingly. Yeah, they need to come up with a more butch name for me to put them things on. I ain't, Man, somebody asked me, what do you wear? Pastor Lon asked me a while back. He says, what, uh, what, what muck boots are you wearing around? I said, muck brand. Man, what would he think of me if I told him I got Tinglys on, man? I don't know. Must be something special. Yeah, it'd be I'll one of those times out. where Pastor Line hey. calls up and says, "Yep, we got the talk, nephew." I, I'm to the point where I'll try them. I mean, muck boot, muck boots. Those those Irish setter ones, they break. The like work boots of Irish setters I have, those are awesome. But the um, what's it called? Like the muck boot version sucks. Yeah. Muck boot sucks. These are meant for people who don't actually work in them. Yeah, I don't. I, yeah, I would love to get a pair of mud boots that actually work. I mean. I work. They're gonna in have to be things. tingly. They ain't gonna, well, I, I ain't gonna tell nobody. I'm gonna change the names on them, dude. We <laughs> have to do something. So, um, hi Billy, live in uh, the mountains of uh, Southwest Montana. Um, I want to get y'all's comfy roots here. My question is, can I keep them in the fridge till the snow mounts or the ground thaws? Uh, the last frost state is going to be in the June. I suggested that um, she go ahead and for anybody else that it applies to. Um, if you're if it's that far off, I would just wait. Hopefully, we got yeah. some by that time. I wouldn't. Well, we'll have some available either shortly before that, during that, or after that. I mean, we'll have comfrey in production for sure by June. But I would, I would wait. Also, the last frost date is in June. That sucks. Yeah, yeah. Unless you like the cold, <laughs> that is shocking to somebody who's lived in Texas at any point in their life. <laughs> yeah, I got one from Andy. Uh, do you know any homesteaders or preppers in the Northeast Georgia? And, and then the title of this one is "Please Help." Oh, uh, do you know any homesteaders or preppers in Northeast Georgia area? I'm looking to form a mag. For those that don't know, that that's a mutual assistance group. Also, just got twenty more comfrey pieces. Well, thank you so much for your your business, and uh, thank you for ordering with us. Um. Okay, I'm going to suggest freesteading.com because they break yeah. it down the state. Um, prepper groups, go to like meetup.com. That's the way I first found out about a prepper group in one area I found out about. Um, that was years ago. Um, that's really going to be the best way now. As far as me personally, I know people all over, but I really don't, I can't. 
Can't really set you up that way. Freesteading is going to be the best way to go. Right. I mean, vouching for somebody for that scenario would be a little odd. Yeah, it's a little bit tough. Yeah. But, yeah, I would definitely start at freesteading.com. And, you know, good question to be asking because right now this is exactly what we were talking about in the very beginning of this thing. I got one from Freeman 0621178. Good stuff as usual in reference to the unnecessary complexity uh, episode, la- the last episode, episode 71. Yeah. Yep. Good stuff as usual. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. That's, that's honestly, I could have spent a lot more time on that one, but I probably went a little far anyway. Well, here's today another podcast that was, <clears throat> excuse me, totally unintended. Yeah, what totally are we call script. this one? <laughs> this could go so many rounds. <laughs> yeah, I got an idea, but man, I don't know if we ought to say it on here. But I think it would be funny. We got one from Andy here. Um, got a couple of questions here. It's about compost. Um, is it counterproductive to continuously add to the pile without actually removing the finished compost? Or would I be better off? Having one pile that is completely finished and one pile that's partially finished. Uh, you can. It depends on what kind of compost pile you're doing. Does he say? Uh, no. Um, I mean, like cold compost piles, usually you just keep adding to them and you don't really do anything to yeah. it on, on some people's varieties or versions of it. Um, if it's an 18-day compost pile, you're not going to have it done in 18 days. But if you're mimicking the flips and stuff like that, You'll just have to flip it for longer. Like, for example, if you have an 18-day compost pile and you add more material on it, like in it in like day four or even 10 or even 17, it's just going to take longer to finish. It's not going to destroy anything. It's just going to take longer to finish. Uh, He's also asking, you know, as far, can you make a pile too big? Yep. Yep. Uh, Over three cubic yards, a hot compost pile can spontaneously combust. We've never seen it happen. Um but that's something we try to avoid. Also flipping a three yard or three cubic yard compost pile sucks. We do it. Well, we've done it plenty of times. I mean, it, yeah, it with does, a team us. <laughs> well, there's times I've done it by myself too, like back in Texas, but um, yeah. So, and then honestly, I would recommend a bigger pile. If you're like the one lady that sent a message a little bit ago, if you're in Montana, you might yeah. want that bigger pile up there. Yeah. But down, you know, in the more temperate places. I don't know if you'd want to be dealing with all that. I mean, unless you got a machine. I mean, they do make those things. Um, we got this one from, um, well, it's in Japan. And they're looking for some wild comfrey. Um, yeah, this is rather lengthy. Um, I don't know if comfrey been, grows wild in Japan. It actually said it does. They've huh. been missionary. <clears throat> Excuse me. He says they've uh, been missionaries over there for 37 years. And they love it. Uh, stumble, stumbled <laughs> onto the YouTube channel a couple of months ago. So, yeah, he says cr- comfrey on. grows wild in Japan. But what I did tell him in terms of some of that comfrey, what we use is Bocking number four, man. Right. I don't know what you're dealing with over there and how it's going to wind up working out. Also, if you've been a missionary over there for 37 years, aren't you just a resident? You're a citizen. <laughs> yeah. Ain't you, ain't you just living there? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he says he loves it. So, I mean, this got to be pretty cool. cool. Yeah, so we got another one from Bruce here. Um, he's got rocky soil issues. I can't get to all of it. Um, but basically he says, yeah, what a great pimp cast. I try to tip a pimp anytime I can. Thank you so much, Bruce. Yeah, thank you. Um, he's got basically rocks um, all over this property. He's been trying to get rid of them. He says, what are some other ideas for a spare rock that's excavated uh, from working the soil? Should I even be de-rocking my soil? Now, that's a loaded question. I would, I mean, if it's on the surface and it's in the way, then yeah, I would pull it off to the side. But if it's in the ground and you're actively trying to pull up rocks out of the ground, I wouldn't. Um, I would just try to build soil on top of that because there are small or very like gentle acids like carbonic acids and, and water, for example, that will help break down that, that those rocks and make those minerals available to the plants or grass or whatever you have growing on top. And you can always build the soil above that. Um, well, it's funny you mention that because Jack Spearco is in exactly that kind of situation. I was just on the phone with him today, and he sent me a picture where he is literally on rock. And if you look at the grass and the pasture that he's grown on rock, yeah, it just goes to show you what good management can do, where he is literally growing stuff on rock. So it may not make a whole lot of sense I mean, obviously, we're going to plant some potatoes down there and stuff. That could be an issue. Yeah. But 
animals, you'd be shocked if, if used the right way, man, you can grow, you can grow soil on just about anything. In fact, we're growing it on some rock out there right now. Yeah. I was going to say we live in North Carolina, like in the mountains of North Carolina and we get have rocks all over the place. Yeah. We're on a big rock, a mountain. Yeah. And then we got outcroppings and stuff that we're yep. actually, you know, well, we're probably going to screw up part of this when we burn on top of this one rock out there. But if you look at the rock around that, I mean, you can see how the soil is encroaching um, to the point where it's covering up the rock. Um, yeah. You got one here from LD. Um, he was, uh, hey, Billy, love your channel. I was wondering if, uh, where you, what year you were in sapper school. Well, it would have been about 94. I'd have to look on my graduation certificate. Um, and that was at, that would have been at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Huh. So, uh, yeah. And then we got a lot of questions here regarding comfrey. Um, oh, let me get to this last one. Um, the comfrey, y'all, we do have it in stock. For all the people that want to know, it's it's there. Um, for now. For now. <laughs> I mean, it'll. we've had rain, so we can't exactly go out and harvest right now. But we'll try to keep it coming because we want to make this stuff so ubiquitous that we can't sell it anymore. Um, and then once you have it, y'all, if you propagate it, you never got to buy it again. You can always make more, give some to your neighbors. Okay. Um, so, um, Scott was asking what kind of birds. Yeah. He says, uh, can I ask what kind of chicks you're raising in your chicken tractor and where I can get some? I see that many are already selling out. Yeah. That's going to be an issue. Yeah. And I I wrote back to him, but I'm basically going to tell him. And the reason why I'm covering this is because I'm sure a number of others have this other, this question as well. Um, I would bet a dollar to a dime that you could probably find some inventive entrepreneur online. that's basically hatching them out of their or, house, or they might even have a full blown flock. Unless you're looking for specifically meat birds. Um, they yeah. might have a flock that they're just trying to get rid of because there might be some of those homesteaders that they got started in 2019 that are burned out now and they want to quit. Or they saw the, well, I doubt anybody's quitting just yet. Now let things turn for the better and you're going to see a mass exodus out of this whole movement. Um, one thing to really consider is like when our system, if it was a dual purpose bird, they generally do well within the system. And I'm talking like an Ostralorp. Bard Rock, Rhode Island Red, you get the point. Any one of those is going to do fine, but we have something of a hodgepodge. We have, I don't even know what any of these birds are. I really don't. Pimp um, breed. Yeah, we just, we get a new rooster and then we hatch out another batch and then the other ones go in the freezer. These guys take their place. Um, that's really it, the way we do it. I'm really not concerned. Only thing I want them to do, what's really, what really matters to me. Can they move material in a chicken tractor on steroids? That is very important to us. And also, are they producing eggs? Um, even if they didn't produce eggs, they would still have great value out here on the property. But that's really it in a nutshell, y'all. No, what did I say? A nutshell. No, I meant to say that's really it in an eggshell. <laughs> hey, y'all. So this was something more of an unexpected podcast. Hopefully the uh, person whose mom tuned in <laughs> is not thinking like, son, what on earth did you get me into? I Sorry, can't Marilyn. believe you got me listening to these two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Till next time. Stay alert. Stay alive.